Hello. When I was preparing this speech, I totally failed to grasp the irony of talking about memory while trying to remember your speech. <laughs> I'm happy to report that my sense of irony definitely caught up with me like three seconds ago. <laughs> it was like, oh shoot. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to talk about today, well, Jaywan came and asked me if I would give a speech about poetry. Somehow it got out that I'm an amateur poet and that poetry is a big part of my life. And um, so I was going to say no at first, and then I realized that I did actually have something that I wanted to share with students about the value of poetry in my own life. And it was something that took me quite a while to discover. I didn't really learn um, this one specific thing poetry could do for me until I moved to Zimbabwe in 2008. And obviously poetry is a beautiful thing. I've always enjoyed it, and as an English teacher, I've always taught it. I've always really loved reading it, but I wasn't writing any. And then when I moved to Zimbabwe, suddenly my life was full of all of these experiences that were incredibly beautiful and incredibly painful because I knew I would have to leave. I was um, camping in mana pools on a regular basis with my family, which is this amazing game park on the banks of the Zambezi River. And you set up your tent, and all night long you listen to hippos. And in the morning you go on game drives um, with, your, with your family, and the air is just amazing, and the animals are beautiful, and every moment is like candy. It's just exquisite. The air is just edible, and every experience is so unique. And that was, that was, it was so fun, but it was so hard because I knew it wasn't going to last, and that I would have to, you know, I wasn't going to get to live in Zimbabwe for the rest of my life. Um, though I have to say, if I had three days to live, I'd go back there and die under a tree, just, you know, for the record. <laughs> but, um... I started thinking, well, how can I record this so that I can access it later? And of course, in the age that we live in, we all feel like taking pictures is the way to remember stuff. Um, so we bought a better camera, and we started taking it on our camping trips with us. And a funny thing happened. You know, we took some nice pictures that I really am glad that we have, but most of the pictures that I actually really like from that time are of things like the river and a tree. Um, they're beautiful scenes that um, connect me to that place, but they don't really tie me to a specific memory at all. And we would spend time in Manipools with something like a, an elephant. You know, we'd be in our car with the windows rolled down and the engine off and the elephant eating like right there. And we'd be able to hear her tearing out the grass and snapping saplings like carrot sticks and it was like church or something totally sacred you would stand there and you know we, we would be in our car looking at each other like oh my gosh you know we'd be whispering and uh, she'd be there and she'd blink and we'd be like look at our eyelashes you know <laughs> and it was incredible and then we'd get home and we'd look at our picture of that elephant and it was like Oh my God, it's a picture of an elephant. And there are like 500 million pictures of elephants. An elephant in a picture is just an elephant, you know? And the magic of that moment together, that shared space would be totally gone. So I, <laughs> I, I didn't know how to do this, how I would ever remember in any detail what my life there had been like. And so I started you know, writing it down. And in the moment, I would have my pen. And um, as I saw something amazing, you know, a little phrase would come to me and I would write it down. And then later I would work through it and start to give it structure and try to make it true to the experience of that elephant in that moment or the lions that I watched or whatever. And an amazing thing started to happen for me. And I realized that as I worked with the language of, of poetry and the memory of my experience, 
that memory became incredibly anchored. And I didn't lose my memories of the experiences that I was having. And I thought that was pretty neat, but I didn't really understand why that might be. So in preparation for this speech, actually, I started to look into what's actually happening in our brains when we write creatively. And it was pretty fun to find out that there's a lot going on. Um, the first thing I learned is that um, when we write creatively, according to Alice Flaherty, a neurologist and an author who's very interested in what happens when we write, um, five different parts of our brains are activated by that act. So the limbic system, which is the center of our emotions, is activated. Um, so is the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, and both the right and left hemispheres. So that helped me to understand why maybe this was working so well for me. First off, because as I was writing about my experiences, I was using five parts of my brain, and that's a lot of different connections to make to a memory. So that was pretty cool. And then I started to think, well, I already know that cool things happen in your brain when you read. So I went and reviewed some information that I'd read a couple years ago about exactly what it is that's going on when we read creative writing. So um, neurologists have been studying MRI scans of people as they read fiction. And it turns out that when you read an evocative image, um, something sensory, the corresponding cortex of your brain lights up. So if I read a tactile image comparing something to, say, corduroy, then um, my sensory cortex lights up. And if I read a smell word like copy, um, my olfactory cortex lights up. And that's pretty cool, because what it means is that our brains treat um, sensory language like a real sensory experience. So what this meant to me was that every time I wrote poetry, I was making all these connections in my brain. And then every time I read my own poem about my own memory, I was then able to sort of relive the experience in a simulated way because my brain was lighting up as I was reading. So that's pretty cool and pretty powerful because it means that everyone has the tools that they need to remember their own lives. And I thought that that was kind of amazing. And I thought that poetry is actually, I mean, I, I kind of just stumbled onto this, but poetry is a really perfect way to capture memories specifically because memories tend to be contained. Um, we don't remember super long chains of events. It's not like in your mind there's like a, a saga novel, you know? It's more like these flashes of intense emotion and a contained experience, like a little, a little bubble scene in your mind. And poems are perfect for that. They're structurally flexible. Um, they can be as long or as short as you need them to be. They um, use evocative language. They push us to find the perfect image, the perfect word for whatever it is that we've experienced. And that's the kind of language that lights up our, our minds the most. So poetry is, is a great form um, for, for fitting around a memory. But the other thing I like about it a lot, and I'm going to come back to the idea of pictures here, is that it captures something intangible. A poem is your voice, and it's really an expression of your consciousness. So when you write a poem about a particular moment in your life, you're capturing your consciousness in that moment, your own emotional state, your own thoughts. And that's amazing because that thing goes away. And I think we all think that the one thing we'll always have is us, right? I mean, I'm never going to not be me. But that's not really true. The fact is that I'm already not the me I used to be. And the me of the future is really not the me that I am right now. And if I want to have a connection with the person I am, I have to write that person down. Another thing that I've learned um, about, about the brain is that our memories 
aren't as solid as we think they are. And I think that's why I wanted to talk about this um, to teenagers, because I think I thought I would always remember myself, you know? And, um, and I don't. There, there's so much I can't remember, like most of my 20s. <laughs> I, had, I had a baby, and I think she ate them. <laughs> they are gone. <laughs> and um, I think that, that you, you think it's always going to be there, but it's not. And so there's this process in your brain um, called reconsolidation. And it turns out that every time you call up a memory, your, your brain rebuilds it on the molecular level. So it's not actually the same memory that you remembered the last time you remembered that memory. Every time you call up a memory, you're reconstructing it. And so your current emotions affect it. Whatever's happening in your life right now affects the way you remember it and what you, what you remember about it. Um, I know we've all seen people whose stories change a little bit every time they tell them, right? Um, that's totally normal. That's what happens. Um, have you ever had the experience of, say, remembering someone, remembering your memories with someone after your feelings about them change? Like if you get mad at your friend, then when you remember the things you did together before, it's like, oh, they're tainted, you know? <laughs> or if you fall in love and you remember the things that happened before with that person, suddenly they're rosier, you know? And that's your current emotional state changing and molding those memories. So what this means to me is that if you want to remember yourself, you have to write yourself down. I know I have pictures at home of myself, you know, everybody does in other times of my life. And as the years pass, they become more and more inadequate at connecting me to the person that I used to be. Um, I know I have a picture of myself when I was like 17. I'm standing in the driveway with my dad and uh, I look happy, but I really, I don't know anything about that person anymore. You know, I, I look at her and I kind of think she's a ghost or a stranger. Uh, I don't know anymore what she was excited about, what she was worried about, or um, who she thought she wanted to be. And I wish I did know those things. I really wish that I could say to her now, you know, write down those things so that I can read about them later, so I can connect to who I used to be. I can't say that to her. She's gone. But I would like to say it to you. If you're in high school, write yourself down, right? And the next time a significant moment arrives, put the selfie stick away. It's not going to help you. It's not going to record anything about who you really are. It's a completely external representation of yourself that will not tell you the important things about you that you're going to want to know later. All right? So write yourself down. Thank you.